involved in a discovery that turned history on its head. Not many people can say that. In my case, though, it wasn't just history that was turned on its head. It was everything else, too. My present. And my future. Yet, back then, of course, I had no inkling of that. Back then, <laughs> I had no inkling of anything. In the summer of 1939, I was on honeymoon with my husband, Stuart. We were staying in a small seaside town in Devon. I'm off for my morning walk, darling. Are you sure you'll be all right? Oh, I'll be fine. After Stuart had gone, I sat in the drawing room and read the newspaper. Several of the other guests were also there, sitting half buried in their tatty chairs, staring out with veiled, incurious eyes. Part of me wanted to pull them to their feet, the women as well as the men, and spin them round, twirl them out of themselves. This thought, though, was immediately succeeded by a sense of guilt. Telegram! Telegram for Pickett! What a troublesome Telegram. nature I have. And how hastily I rush to judge people. Telegram for Pickett? Yes, um, here. You're a Mrs. Pickett? Yes. The words S. Pickett, Esquire, were typed on the envelope. I picked it up, wondering who could have died or suffered some dreadful accident... Telegrams always meant bad news. Everybody knew that. Meanwhile, the other guests were staring at me from the depths of their chairs, all of them clearly suspecting me of being an imposter, yet willing me to open the envelope just the same. I sat and waited for Stuart to come back, forcing myself to concentrate on the newspaper. But I only managed it for a few more minutes before jumping to my feet and running from the room, doubtless provoking another rustle of disapproval. Outside, I saw Stuart walking along the front, his hair plastered down with rain. <laughs> what is it? Look. Major find in Suffolk, stop. Buried ship, stop. Come at once, stop. Bring wife, stop. Regards Phillips, stop. A typical Phillips. Issuing lordly commands and expecting everyone to drop what they're doing. What are you going to tell him? That it's impossible, of course. Why? Well, what if this find really is as exciting as he says? Darling, we're on our honeymoon. But if we don't go, we might kick ourselves in years to come. When we're old. Darling, no, it's simply not fair on you. I only wish the hotel wasn't so fatty gay. Still, that the weather's bound to buck up soon. Well... What, you... You, you really think that... Goodness, well, I, I suppose we we could go. I, I, I just hate to think of you being disappointed, that's all. Oh, I could never be disappointed. Not when I'm with you. As the road switched back and forth between the folds of hills, I couldn't entirely suppress a sense of relief. It felt as if we were climbing out of a hole... By the time we arrived in Woodbridge, it was after six o'clock. Stuart had arranged to meet Charles Phillips at the Bull Hotel. Phillips had reserved us a twin-bedded room with a shared bathroom at the end of the corridor. Although Stuart and I had talked about Phillips on the journey up, nothing had quite prepared me for my first sight of him. He was a much larger man than I had expected. Although he carried his bulk, if not proudly, then with a definite air of entitlement... By contrast, his bow tie was rather small. He looked like an inappropriately wrapped parcel. Uh, what would you like to drink, my dear? A half of bitter, please. Oh, right. Two and a half pints of best, please, Bum. Uh, to business, then. Yes. The ship is more than 80 feet long so far. Goodness. And it may well be close to 100 feet by the time both ends have been exposed. That, of course, would make it by far the largest buried ship ever found in this country. Yes, the actual wood has rotted clean away, leaving only a hard crust of sand behind. Mm. As for dates, my estimate at this stage is somewhere around 800 AD. Thank you. Uh, Thank you. I don't think we'll be able to pinpoint it more accurately until we see what's in the burial chamber. I'm afraid everything's been a bit of a mess so far. A local man called Brown was having a go under the auspices of Ipswich Museum. Completely self-taught, I'm afraid. He was on the verge of going into the chamber. 
but all he had managed to find was a coin and several of the collapsed roof timbers. Right. Fortunately, I stepped in before any real damage could be done. I should tell you that the landowner, Mrs. Pretty, is a rather awkward lady. Recently widowed, I understand, so that might explain it. However, thanks to some nimble footwork on my part, I don't anticipate any further difficulties. Uh, w w what about uh, events in the wider world? Hmm? The wider world? The Germans. I don't recall a ship burial ever being discovered in Germany. N no, I, I, I meant the, the possibility, and uh, well, the likelihood even, of war. Oh, that? Well, we'll have to get our skates on. I would say we have a couple of weeks to complete the excavation. No more than three at the most. you excuse me a moment? It's a uh, beer. It goes right through me, I'm afraid. Oh. <clears throat> oh, Mr. Phillips, I um, I wanted to tell you how flattered I was that you specifically asked for me to come here. Oh. I only hope that I'll be able to repay your faith. It's just, it's just I haven't done very much actual field work. I wouldn't want you to think I was more experienced than I actually am. Oh, never mind about that. You have the key attributes. That's all that matters. I do. Are you quite sure? It's perfectly simple. Look at me. What do you see? A man? I happen to have large bones. It runs in my family. Stuart has smaller bones, but even he must be around the 12 stone mark. You, however, by virtue of your sex, are a good deal smaller and lighter than either of us. The ship is in a very delicate condition. Put too much weight on it, and the whole thing could disintegrate. Mm. It therefore seems sensible that I should supervise matters from outside the trench, while you will be able to get on with the actual digging. Mr. Phillips, am I to understand that you only asked me here because of my size? The next morning, we drove out to the dig. Despite my having tried to imagine the site beforehand, it still took my breath away. There was a majesty about the sweep and scale of the ship I had not expected. There was also something immensely moving about the way in which it had resisted obliteration by transforming itself from one substance into another. From wood into sand. It was like this giant apparition lying before us. Three men were lined up on one side of the trench. Now, now this is Mr. Spooner. Sir, ma'am. And Mr. Jacobs. Ma'am, sir. And this is Mr. Brown, who did such sterling work on the earlier stages of the dig. Ah, how, how do you do? do? Pleased to meet you, Mr. Piggott. Mrs. Piggott. Basil Brown was a small, chiselled-looking man, wearing an ancient tweed jacket and what may once have been a matching tweed cap. In view of his appearance, it came as something of a surprise that he should ever have been in charge of the excavation. However, from my first impression of the site, he appeared to have made a perfectly competent job of it. Look, Mama, you can see the whole shape of the ship now. This is pretty. I want you to meet our two latest recruits. <laughs> Hello. Hello. During the morning, Mrs. Pretty and her son Robert came out to see how we were getting along. Once again, Phillips introduced us. I couldn't help noticing that Mrs. Pretty seemed rather old to have such a young son. Stuart and I divided the ship into squares and we started cleaning down the south side of the burial area. At seven o'clock we finished for the day and drove back to the bull. I was muddy from the dig and decided to take advantage of the fact that the bathroom was free. As I lowered myself down I could feel the line between hot and cold sliding up my body from my calves up to my hips. Once I was fully immersed I lay back gasping as the water closed over my chest. Enveloped in steam, shiny with soap, I lay back, spreading my hands, letting my arms float out on either side of me. I found myself thinking about the flat in Great Ormond Street, which I had moved into at the start of my second year at the university. It was the first place where I had ever felt truly at home, able to be myself. From a second-hand shop in the Theobalds Road, I bought an old EMG gramophone with a brass horn and a box of needles. For an extra five shillings, the man offered to sell me a case of records. One of them was the Violin Concerto No. 1 by Max Bruch. Well, I, I had never heard it before, but from the moment it began, I was filled with a kind of ecstatic familiarity. 
Dressed only in my underclothes, I had started to dance around the flat, improvising as best as I could, flinging out my legs and throwing back my head, catching glimpses of my reflection in the long mirror as I span past. My body no longer lumpish and ungainly, but sleek and straining to take to the air. Oh! Oh! I'm terribly sorry. You, you you, must have left the door unlocked. You will be careful, won't you, darling? I mean, I could have been anyone. The next morning, Stuart and I started where we had left off. The clouds soon parted and lifted. By the time Mrs Pretty and Robert came out, the sun was shining more fiercely than it had done all summer. Normally... There is something not just absorbing, but soothing about narrowing one's focus to such a small area. Your world has shrunk to a few square inches of earth. Now, though, I found that my concentration had been affected. While my hands kept working away, my mind kept wandering off on its own, drifting away. Yet there was one image I couldn't dislodge, no matter how hard I tried. All the time, I kept seeing Stuart's face looking round the bathroom door. Except that the steam had parted and I could see his expression quite clearly. Shocked. But not simply shocked. Something more than that. I kept telling myself that I must be mistaken. But the more I told myself, the less convincing it became. I know that I must be doing something wrong that I must be disappointing Stuart in some critical way. I cannot tell if it is my appearance or my troublesome nature, or both. I so want to make myself attractive to him that it is having the opposite effect. But I have no idea how to make anything better, or who to turn to for advice. As my hands kept on troweling, my eyes started to mist over. Angrily, I, I wiped the moisture away. It was only then that I saw what was lying in front of me. My first thought was that I must have dropped something. It looked so bright, so raw, so absurdly new. I reached out and my fingers touched a small, hard object. At the same time, I heard myself saying, Oh, in a faraway voice. And then I picked it up. Lying in the palm of my hand was a gold pyramid. No more than an inch and a half across. It was flattened on top and decorated with what appeared to be tiny pieces of garnet and lapis lazuli. Stuart? What is it, darling? Will you come over here, please? <sighs> Where did you find this? Just, just down there. You clever girl. <laughs> Clever, clever girl. Um, uh, may I have your attention, everyone? Uh, Peggy, my wife, has found something <laughs> that I'm sure will interest you. What is it? What have you found? Is it gold? Oh, yes. <laughs> it's gold, all right. <laughs> In the summer of 1939, I was on honeymoon with my husband, Stuart, when we received a telegram asking us to come up to Sutton Hoo in Suffolk. The outline of an enormous buried ship had been discovered there. Viking, or perhaps even Anglo-Saxon. Two days after we arrived, I was troweling away in the centre of the ship, when there in front of me, I found this exquisite piece of jewellery. <laughs> Is it gold? Is it gold? Everyone was straining forward, looking over the bank down into the ship. We crossed over to the ladder. I went up first. Mrs Pretty, who owned the house at Sutton Hoo, was waiting at the top with her son, Robert. Please just try to be patient, Robbie, please. You found this, did you, Mrs Pickett? I believe so. I mean, yes. Well done, my dear. What a wonderful discovery. Part of me wanted to tell her that it had just been lying there, that all I had to do was bend down and pick it up. But however ill-deserved this praise may have been, I didn't want it to stop. Not completely. 
We stood around for a while in a, a dazed sort of way. As we did so, I noticed Mr. Brown. He was hanging back, apart from the others, not saying anything. Well, as he had been in charge of the excavation to begin with, I thought he would like to see the gold pyramid. He stared at it for a few moments, and then asked where I had found it. Just down there, Mr. Brown. Just to the left of that greenish band. I, I can easily show you. If you'd just like to come down the ladder with me... Best not, thank you. Mr. Phillips said he doesn't want me going anywhere near the burial chamber. Why on earth would he say that? Oh, I dare say he has his reasons. As we stood there looking down into the ship, Mr. Brown told me when he first realised what they had found. All week it had been bucketing down. The rain came in over our boots. At times it felt as if we were digging into the side of a small mountain. Then, at around three o'clock, I was working away in the bottom of the trench when I heard John Jacobs shout. Basil, can you come over here? I scrambled up the bank to where John Jacobs was standing. In his hand he was holding a piece of iron. It was much corroded and roughly the size of a bolt. When I asked him to show me where he'd found it, he pointed at a pinky brown patch in the sand. I was just about to have a closer look when I noticed another patch of pink sand, about six inches away on the left-hand side. I dug down and there was a second piece of metal. Now what have we here, I thought. It seemed familiar somehow, although I was damned if I could think why. Then all at once it popped into my mind. Oldborough. Yes, that's it. I've seen one of these in the museum at Oldborough. Stay here with you, lads. And uh, be sure not to touch anything. I'll be back as soon as I can. By the time I reached Rendlesham Forest, the mist was already rising off the trees. Coming closer to the sea, the breeze was so strong it nearly took my cap off. I rolled through fields of wheat and sedge until I reached the ferry crossing opposite Slaughton. As luck would have it, a ferry was about to depart. The moment the ferry touched land, I was off. I parked my bike outside the museum and asked the woman behind the desk if I could have a look in their storeroom. While I was searching through one of the lower drawers, I saw a piece of purple cloth all tattered round the edges. I picked up the cloth and something heavy and cylindrical fell out. A piece of metal. Underneath was a typed label giving the date of discovery, May 1870, along with a place where it had been found, Snape Common. I must have stayed staring at the label for several minutes. Steady on, Basil, I told myself. Easy does it. But even as I was giving myself a talking to, I could hear my heart pounding away. Come with me, will you, lads? And bring the tape measure. Within half an hour, I had uncovered five patches of pink sand. All of them the same distance apart, but spreading out towards the edge of the trench. Each one set a little deeper than the one before. What is it, Pat? I think... I think it's a ship. So you realised these were the rivets that had held the ship together? That's right. The wood had all rotted away, but it had left this hard crust of sand with the outline of the planks imprinted on it. Now, I crept along from one rivet to the next, and the deeper I went, the wider the ship became. Before long, it was plain that we were up against a far larger thing than anyone had imagined. Bigger than anything that had ever been found before. Yeah, trouble was, of course, it was so fragile, so open to the elements. And then the next night, as it happened, there was this tremendous storm. I sat up in the middle of the night, unable to work out what had woken me. It didn't take long. Rain was drumming against the window. Fetching a torch, I made my way downstairs. There was an oilskin hanging by the door. Hurriedly, I pulled it over my head. Outside, the rain was blowing down near horizontal. Once I reached the mounds, I saw it was just as I had feared. The tarpaulins were flapping about like untethered sails. 
Rain was pouring into the ship. When I grabbed hold of one of the tarpaulins, it immediately pulled me over. The only solution was to tie two of them together. Then I dragged them round the exposed end of the ship, this before stretching out the tarpaulin and securing the other side. I managed to secure the first two like this, but on the third, I lost my footing again and began falling right into the innards of the ship. I could feel wet sand raking through my fingers. Finally, I came to a halt. Hand over hand, I began to haul myself up the bank. When I reached the top, I could see the treetops tossing about above my head. Still on all fours, I scuttled from one top hole into the next until they were all secure. I had no idea how much water had got in. My biggest worry, one I could hardly allow myself to think of, was that a large section of the ship might have been completely washed away. The moment dawn broke, I was out of the house. All the way to the mounds, I was fretting about what I might find. First, I unpegged the tarpaulins and rolled them back. As far as I could tell, there was no damage at all. I spent the next hour and a half waiting for John and Will to arrive, until I remembered it was a Saturday and they wouldn't be coming at all. However, Mrs. Pretty's son, Robert, did come out to help. Yeah. See, uh, pull it a bit tighter, Robert. Yeah, tighter. Tight that end up a bit. That's it. That's it. Lovely. Can I ask you a question, Mr. Brown? Go on then, boy. Why would anyone want to bury a ship under the ground? Well, probably so that the ship could take whoever was buried inside from this world into the next. But where is this next world, Mr. Brown? Ah, uh, no one is absolutely sure about that. Uh, but if nobody is sure, how do they know it's there? Well, they don't know. Not exactly. They just, they just hope. But surely they must have some idea. I mean, I know where Norwich is, although I've never been there. Well, that's, that's more complicated than that. How? Because it just is. Come on. We can't stand here nattering all day. That's when I realised we weren't going to be able to keep it quiet for long. The news had already got out. Well, tongues were starting to wag, put it that way. As I was clearing up that evening, I looked up to see Mr. Reed Moyer from Ipswich Museum. He was standing above my head, framed against the sky. So, this is it. This is it. You realise that we, Ipswich, that is, will be the envy of every museum in the country. In Europe, even. And now then, Brown, I can hardly overemphasize the need for discretion. The last thing we want is anyone else sniffing around and trying to steal our thunder. Of course, Reed Moyer wasn't the only one. There was also Charles Phillips from Selwyn College, Cambridge. Had you met Phillips before? No, but I'd heard of him, though. Whatever happened, I knew I didn't have much time left on my own. The next morning, I began to excavate the western end of the chamber. And within a few hours, I came across something solid. It appeared to be made out of clay, about three feet in length and 18 inches wide. The, the three of us prized it free. Underneath lay a square patch of earth, much darker than the sandy soil all around. It was just like a trapdoor. Well, can you come and lend a hand? Is this it, Basil? Is this the burial chamber? Yes, I think so. Taking the bodkin, I began scratching away. The first chink was so faint I scarcely heard it. I tried again. There was another chink. As I swept the earth away, a bluish-grey shape began to appear. I told myself it was probably a pebble. I went on telling myself it was a pebble until I could be certain that it was a coin. No bigger than a shirt button. On one side of it was a plain cross, on the other what appeared to be the imprint of a head. When Jacob and Will left for the day, I carried on scraping and brushing. The light was starting to go. When I looked at my watch, it was already past 8.30, I couldn't believe it. The sweat ran down my nose and dripped onto the ground. I can't see how much later it was. Time seemed to be rushing away from me when I came across a piece of wood. 
so decayed, even my pastry brush was too rough. In one place, though, the timber was quite solid. When I tapped it with my finger, it gave out a soft, hollow sound. Mr. Brown? What are you doing here? Uh, I, I saw the glow of your pipe. Have you found something, Mr. Brown? Can I come and have a look? Not now, boy. Just, uh, just go back to bed and leave me be. By the time I looked up again, Robert had gone. The light was fast disappearing. In the top left corner, I could just make out a small hole in the wood. It was then I did something shameful. Something I can never properly explain. I pushed my finger through the hole. It went in quite easily, the timber fitting snugly round my knuckle. Beyond was a cavity. By now I could hardly see the wood, it was so dark. Yet still I couldn't bear to take my finger away. When at last I did, a great wash of sadness came over me. So strong it quite knocked me back. After I'd covered over the centre of the ship with tarpaulins and secured the corners with stones, I set off for Sutton House. The gravel path ran pale and straight in front of me. The sky was black as hogs. Mrs. Pretty's butler, greatly, answered the door. Would you tell Mrs. Pretty I need to see her? Now? Do you know what time it is? Mrs. Pretty will be preparing for bed. Even so, I need to see her. Greatly gave me a look, frowning mostly. Although there might have been some sympathy in it. I'm sorry, Basil. You'll just have to wait until the morning. I was standing on the side of the mound at Sutton Hoo with Basil Brown, looking down at the outline of the enormous ship that had been buried there. He was telling me how he had found the burial chamber in the centre of the ship, and how he had taken the news to Mrs. Pretty, who owned the land where the excavation was taking place. When he was shown into the hallway, he could hear voices inside the drawing room. The moment he knocked on the door, the voices stopped. Ah, oh, thank you so much for coming, Mr. Brown. Have you met Charles Phillips from Selwyn College, Cambridge? Uh, of course you know Mr. Reed Moore from Ipswich Museum. Mr. Brown... I have asked you here to discuss a rather delicate matter. Um... Now, you mustn't take this personally, Brown. Take what personally? Hmm? What I'm about to say. As you know, this is now a very important dig, among the most important ever discovered in this country, one that simply cannot be left in the hands of an ad hoc team from a small provincial museum. Therefore, with the full agreement of Mrs Pretty and, of course, of Mr Reed Moyer, I have assumed full control of the excavation. You're replacing me? That is not how I would choose to put it, Brown. I very much hope that you'll feel able to carry on, albeit in a more subordinate role, of course. I see. When exactly are you taking over, Mr Phillips? Immediately. From today. In which case, I'd like to assure you that I'll do anything I can to help, in whichever way you see fit. There. I told you I didn't anticipate any difficulties. That man. I'm surprised you could stand to remain here. Oh, I don't care about Phillips. I spent my whole life around here, you see. And my father before me. This land is in my blood, I suppose. But despite everything, I couldn't bring myself to leave. I was still thinking about what Mr Brown had told me when it began to rain. At first, it looked as if it would be no more than a shower, but then came several claps of thunder. By six, it was plain that we were not going to be able to continue. Stuart and I drove back to Woodbridge with Charles Phillips. I'll sit in the front, shall I? I'm sure you can squeeze in the back, my dear. Ugh. I sat with the window open and the thundery breeze buffeting against my face. As we drew up outside the Bull Hotel, the street lights were already being turned on. Orange balls of light stood out against the dark grey sky. 
Got a new face on I've seen you in here before. <laughs> oh, you're one of those archaeologists working over at Sutton. Oh, yes. I found any gold, have you, old boy? Um, well, as a matter of fact, my, my pockets are absolutely crammed with Oh, <laughs> marvellous. <laughs> marvellous. Well, you must have a drink then. Thank you. Um, I, I think I could do with one. Uh, me. Oh, congratulations, darling. Yes, congratulations. People spend entire lifetimes waiting for a discovery like this. It hardly seems fair that it should happen to one so inexperienced. <laughs> Nonetheless, here's to you, my dear. Cheers. Now, let's think about period. My initial feeling is that we were looking at something near 800 AD. However, this changes everything. Let's also consider the coin that Brown found before I arrived. I've had this dated from between 575 and 625 AD. My feeling is that the jewellery comes from much the same period. Considering all this, what do we have? We have a buried Anglo-Saxon ship, almost 100 feet in length, with what appears to be an intact burial chamber at the heart of it. But surely... Yes? Well, if that is right, surely it would alter our entire understanding of the Dark Ages. Hmm. It would, rather. You should feel very proud of yourself, darling. I turned my face up towards Stuart, mm -hmm. wanting above all to feel his mouth on mine. It would have been the crowning of a wonderful day. Without relaxing his grip, he tilted his head down towards me. We stayed like that for some time. Then he gently extricated himself and went back over to the armchair. He undid his boots, folded his trousers over the arm of the chair, and buttoned up his pyjamas. When I got into my bed, the sheets were cold against my skin. I had to push my feet down to the bottom of the bed in one movement for fear that they would become stuck halfway. Even then, there was a moment when I doubted if the warmth of my body would be enough to drive the cold away. Ready? Ready. Sleep well, darling. The next morning, I continued working in the same part of the burial chamber, while Stuart moved to the westernmost corner. Phillips patrolled up and down the edge of the trench, monitoring our progress. Try to make sure you step on the planks wherever possible, will you? Psst, darling, darling, come here a moment. What is it? Can you see that? Something glimmering when it catches the light. Yes. Thank God for that. I was beginning to think I must be imagining it. What is it? What have you found? Um, it's more gold. Quite a bit more gold, in fact. <laughs> <laughs> there were three separate pieces. One appeared identical to the pyramid I had found the day before. The other two were small gold plaques, both around two inches in length. All of them were so beautiful. So delicate, and yet so pristine. Like emissaries from another world. As I looked at them, I was overcome by an enormous sense of insignificance. Not just my own, but everyone's. I felt as if we were all insects who had been tipped onto our backs and were waving our legs vainly at the sky. Mrs. Pretty's nephew, Rory, arrived that afternoon. He was riding a heavily laden bicycle and weaved his way unsteadily towards the mounds. Piled up behind his saddle were several cylindrical shaped bags. His appearance was as chaotic as his bicycle. He had on yellow oilskin trousers and what appeared to be an old golfing jacket. On his head, worn back to front, was a baggy checked cap. <laughs> he looked just like an Irish tinker. However, he seemed to know what he was doing. Out of one of the tubes, he took the component parts of a tripod and screwed them together. Once that was done, he started taking various photographs of the pieces of jewellery, as well as several more of the interior of the ship. Can I carry your tripod, please, Rory? Of course you can, Robert. Be grateful for your help. Mm. 
morning, darling. Mm. Uh, I'm afraid I'm going to have to leave you for a day or two. Oh? Phillips believes the sooner the treasure is in the British Museum, the better. Well, plainly, that's oh. the place for it, although he anticipates Reed Moyer trying to create trouble and claiming it belongs in Ipswich. But surely any finds belong to Mrs. Pretty. Oh, well, that's another question altogether. Mm. Look, I'd, I'd better go, otherwise I'll miss my train. Charles Phillips was in a foul mood that morning. He had just heard that Mrs Pretty had invited a lot of people to a sherry party so that they could see the ship. Clearly she had failed to consult him beforehand. Before we went any further, Phillips wanted everything we had found to be properly packaged up before being sent down to London. We needed something that was both soft and durable to pack them in. I didn't like to mention it at first. I thought Phillips might scoff at the idea. But when I suggested that the moss in the nearby wood might prove ideal, he agreed it was worth a try. I volunteered to go and cut some. I'll come with you, Mrs Piggott. I know just the place. All right, then. You show me. The moment we stepped into the wood, the air grew cooler. The sunlight filtered through the leaves, bathed <laughs> everything in soft green light. One of the men had lent me a pruning knife. It was with surprising ease that I was able to hack at the moss, tearing it out in large squares. When I stood up, I saw an enormous silver object floating in the sky over Woodbridge. As I watched, a second silver object rose into the air beside it. Barrage balloons. Mr Brown told me about them. They're to stop enemy aircraft. I put my arm around Robert's shoulders, and together we stood watching as the two balloons bumped into one another. Picking up armfuls of cut moss, we began to climb back up the slope. On the way, we passed a khaki-coloured bell tent. The flap was tied back. Inside, I could see a sleeping bag and some scattered clothes. Before I could ask, Robert told me that this was where Mrs Pretty's nephew, Rory, was staying. Isn't he allowed indoors? <laughs> it's not that silly. He prefers being out here. <laughs> The sun beat down even more fiercely than before. I was wearing a sleeveless blouse. I could almost see my arms and shoulders turning an angry red colour. This, though, was no time for vanity. That afternoon, I uncovered a tangled mass of purplish metal, roughly spherical in shape. Stop! What do you think you're doing? When I'd finished, I went looking for Charles Phillips to show it to him. I found him at the bottom of the bank, shouting at Mrs. Pretty's nephew. Haven't I told you before? You can't simply wander around taking your photographs as you see fit. In future, I must insist you ask my permission. Have I made myself clear? I wonder if I might have a word, Mr. Phillips. Just... just wait till I've finished. Where exactly would you like me to wait? Here, or shall I go back to the chamber? What? Wait, wherever you like. Oh, never mind. I've finished here anyway. I should keep your distance. I'm in the doghouse. So I see. I know these are not exactly ideal circumstances, but we've never really met. I'm Rory, Rory Lomax. Peggy Pickett. I'm just staying here for a few days. I know, I've seen your tent. <laughs> yes, well, I'm not really camping out, you know. I mean, I am, but I can always take a bath in the house, so I'm a bit of a fraud, really. <laughs> Mind you, there's nothing to beat sleeping out of doors, not at this time of year. Lying in my tent and listening to the nightingales. Nightingales? Haven't you heard them? Only on the wireless. On the wireless? No, oh, it doesn't matter. No, 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 please. There's, um... Oh, there's a cellist called Beatrice Harrison. During the summer, she liked to practice her cello out of doors. One evening, she was playing a piece of music when, to her astonishment, she heard a nightingale singing along with her. At first, she thought it must be a strange coincidence, but... Just to make sure, she started playing a scale. As she did so, the nightingale accompanied her. <laughs> Miss Harrison was so excited, she went to see Lord Reith at the BBC. Cool. The next time Miss Harrison went to practice outside, there were microphones in place. And she started playing as usual, but nothing happened. And then, just as they were all getting ready to go, the nightingale started to sing. And it carried on for the next 15 minutes, its voice rising and falling, along with Miss Harrison's cello. That's wonderful. Yes, it was. 
It was wonderful. The silence between us was broken by a loud <laughs> click. The tangle of metal was still on the grass where I had put it earlier. Only now it had sprung open, apparently warmed by the sun. Inside was a nest of silver bowls. Rory and I took them out. There were eight, all in mint condition. We laid them in a row along the bank. As we did so, sunlight swirled round the inside of their surfaces and bounced back at us. Although the excavation at Sutton Hoo continued to go well, the international situation was declining by the day. It was such a strange feeling, unearthing the remains of this lost civilization at a time when our own civilization was about to be blown to smithereens. Fortunately, we now had a photographic record of the buried ship, thanks to Mrs. Pretty's nephew, Rory. Meanwhile, my husband Stuart was in London at the British Museum. Telegram for you, Mrs. Peggett. When I got back to the bull that evening, there was a telegram from him. Chaos here, stop. Everything taking longer than expected, stop. Back as soon as possible, stop. All love, Stuart. It was only then that I realised I'd better give some thought to what I was going to wear to Mrs. Pretty's sherry party the next day. The only possibility was my going away outfit. But when I put it on, I was appalled to see this brawny farm girl staring back at me from the mirror. My shoulders appeared to have broadened and my wrists to have thickened. The only consolation was that Stuart would be spared from seeing me like this. Now, I'm sure I don't need to tell you that secrecy is the key. If news of this gets out, we'll have all sorts of dreadful people swarming round here, journalists and the like. Don't tell anyone any more than you have to. Is that clear? Quite clear. Good girl. Good afternoon, Phyllis. Ah, Reed Moyer. I introduce one of my fellow archaeologists, Peggy Piggott. Good afternoon. How do you do? I understand you are favouring us with a speech, Phillips. A brief address, nothing more. I trust you'll be paying due credit to Ipswich Museum. I know how much everyone is looking forward to seeing the finds. Then I fear they'll be disappointed. I don't understand. Are you saying the finds are no longer here? Some pieces are still here. However, we've decided not to show them, not to members of the public. Now, look here, Phillips. Surely I don't have to remind you that there wouldn't have been an excavation at all if it hadn't been for Ipswich Museum. Reed Moyer had taken a step forward. Phillips continued to look at him with detached interest, rather as if Reed Moyer was about to attempt an ascent of his shirt front. At that moment, other guests arrived. Unaware that anything was amiss, they began talking to the two of them. I took this opportunity to slip away. Already, people were lining the banks and peering into the ship. After 20 minutes or so, following prompting from the staff, they all sat down. Phillips strode out in front of the chairs. Keeping one hand in his jacket pocket, he proceeded to give a very brief and remarkably undramatic account of the discovery of the ship. Not only that, but his voice sounded oddly faint. It was almost as if he was deliberately speaking as quietly as possible. Matters were not helped by a high-pitched buzzing sound that was coming from overhead. I glanced up. There was an aeroplane high in the sky, the sunlight glinting off its wings. The buzzing sound grew louder. One moment it was an annoying distraction, the next, it had turned into a high-pitched scream. I looked up again. Now, the aeroplane was pointing vertically at the ground. The hood of the cockpit was pulled back. There was a man's head inside, shiny and brown like an enormous nut. You all right? What happened? Some damn fool showing off, I expect. I know that if he was trying to hear what Phillips was saying. <laughs> Look, you've crushed your knee. Uh, it's perfectly all right. No, no, it's bleeding. Here, let me. No, really. But Rory Lomax had already unwound a cream silk scarf from around his neck and was holding it against my leg. Everyone else was standing up now. Some were still brushing themselves down, others talking excitedly to one another. As we walked through the guests, 
I felt like one of those figures from a medieval wall painting whose feet hang in the air, several inches above the ground. What are you planning to do later? I don't know. I hadn't thought. It's just that I wondered if you'd like to go for a walk in the woods to see if we can hear a nightingale. As I said before, it's a bit late in the year now, but you would be very welcome to come along if you like. Well, thank you. Um, I would like that. Good. Well, uh, why don't we meet outside the squash court at um, eight o'clock? When I arrived at the squash court, Rory was already waiting. He was wearing a long herringbone overcoat I had not seen before, along with his Irish tinker's cap. Right. Shall we go? There was a cinder path that skirted the house and crossed the top of a meadow. It must have been a meadow once, although now it was choked with bracken. Running along our left-hand side was a white paling fence. I smelled the sweet, loose smell of gorse, then honeysuckle, and then just as intensely, wild garlic. Rory turned on a torch. A wand of light illuminated our way. At the end of the cinder path was a stile leading into a wood. We descended through the trees, our footfalls giving out muffled thumps. <laughs> oh. Oh. Here, take my hand. <laughs> Just for this bend, till it becomes flatter. Here. Should we try here? Most of the nightingales have paired off by now. There's just the odd few left. The, uh, the unlucky ones, I suppose. <laughs> Mind you, they say that desperation makes them sing all the harder. <laughs> uh. oh. Do you want some coffee? I brought along a thermos. Mm. Through the trees, I could see narrow streaks of silver where the moonlight hit the water. A few stars had appeared above the tops of the trees. Down below, the foliage was too dense for any light to penetrate. Everything was quite black. So are your people from around here? I'm not sure if I have any people. How do you mean? There's something about the darkness that invited confidences. Almost before I was aware of opening my mouth, I found myself telling him how my mother had left us and how my father had died when I was young, and how the four of us... My two sisters, my brother and I, were taken in by my father's brother and his wife. How did your father die, if you don't mind me asking? In the war? No, he drowned. We were on holiday in Cornwall. I saw him being pulled out of the water. They tried to give him mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, but, um... Well, I think he was probably dead already. You're shivering. Let me put this coat round your shoulders. Oh, no, it's please. It's no trouble. <laughs> As hard as I could, I tried to make myself stop shivering, to stop this jumping and twitching in my veins. How did you meet your husband? Stuart? Yes, Stuart. He was my tutor at the university. Oh. And did you know straight away? Did I know what straight away? No, that's none of my business. Tell me, I don't mind. I just wondered if you knew straight away that you wanted to marry him. Not straight away, no. But we had a lot in common. Shared interests are very important, don't you think? Mm. I wouldn't know. No? It's never happened to me. I wish it had, but it hasn't. Not yet. Still, I live in hope. I lay back, resting my head against the bark of the tree. I could no longer see Rory. I could only hear him breathing. What about you? Me? Oh, there's nothing much to tell.
afraid. Well, why don't you tell me what made you become so interested in photography? I suppose it seemed a way of trying to fix moments as they went past, to, uh, to stop them from being lost forever. I don't know if that makes any sense. Of course it does. It makes perfect sense. That's why I wanted to study archaeology. So much of life just slips by, and with so little to show for it. I suppose I wanted to make sense of what does endure. That's it. That's it exactly, especially now. What do you think people are likely to find of us in 2,000 years' time? I mean, do you think they might find this thermos and wonder who it belonged to? Who drank from this cup? And even if they do wonder, they'll never know. Not who we were, what we were thinking and feeling at the time. At, at best, only this, this, <laughs> this thing will have survived. Everything else will have just disappeared. I could feel the blackness in my nostrils. I found myself remembering a story I must have read as a child about an old lady who sneezed and her whole body flew into pieces. I wonder if we should move on. We're not having much like here, are we? We walked down to the water and made our way along another path. After a few hundred yards, it veered away from the river and started to climb back up the bank. As we began climbing, it occurred to me that this was almost certainly the route used to haul the ship up from the river to the mound. Once, hundreds of men had heaved and pushed away here, all of them feeling that another world lay just beyond their reach, perhaps just beneath their feet. I tried to imagine them now, hauling on ropes, bending their backs. Momentarily, they knotted before me, then slipped away. We continued on up the slope, emerging from the wood just by the shepherd's hut. Ahead of us lay the ship. Approaching from an unfamiliar angle, I couldn't get over how raw it looked, how wanton, pegged back like a giant wound. Walking towards the ship, I became aware of something dancing in the air. At first, I thought it could be sand, but this didn't look like sand. It was like a cloud of snowflakes. Rory reached out and snatched at one of them. When he opened his hand, I could see something shining there. What is it? I think it must be gold leaf. <laughs> I remember Philip saying how there was a lot of it lying around. The gold flakes continued to swirl about in the breeze. I could see them quite clearly now. I gazed in wonder. Unable to trust the evidence of my eyes, yet watching the flakes settle on my shoulders and my chest. I held out my arms wide with my palms upwards, wanting as many to fall on me as possible. I had this absurd fancy that I would be all garlanded and crowned like a princess. But when I reached up to feel my hair, all I touched was a piece of twig. It must have become caught there while I'd been lying down. I tried to disentangle it, except it wouldn't come. I only succeeded in making it more tightly snagged. Here, let me. I stayed still while Rory began unpicking the twig from my hair. He did so very carefully, not tugging at all, parting the strands and then unwinding them. It was as if he was picking me apart. All the while, tiny specks of gold leaf continued to fall around us. I could feel them catching in my throat. But still, they were not enough to stop this awful confessional urge that rose within me. It seemed to gather up everything hidden, everything secret, and carry it all out into the open. It's not what you think. What is it? Things between Stuart and me. They're not... Shh, shh, shh. Listen. I heard nothing at first. And then the bird song came from so close at hand that I almost jumped. There were long gurgling trills punctuated by a series of harsh little clicks. We waited too, as the bird waited for a response. There was nothing, only silence. 
Then the singing started up again, both louder and more passionate than before. These bubbles of sound streaming up into the night sky. I had gone for a walk with Mrs. Pretty's nephew, Rory, to see if we could hear nightingales in the woods next to the excavation site at Sutton Hoo. We had heard nothing, not at first. Then, all at once, these bubbles of sound streamed up into the darkness. The nightingale's song was sadder than anything I had ever heard before, full of yearning and desperation and regret. The hope that drove the song forward seemed entwined with the knowledge that it would never be answered. I felt that as long as we could stay as we were, then everything would be all right. The earth might swallow us just as it had done everything else. I wanted this more than anything. But even then I knew that it would never happen. I knew it when I saw a torch beam cutting through the darkness. Good evening. I'm Police Constable Ling. May I have your names, please? At that Peggy moment, Peggy more than anything Peggy else, Peggy I felt relief. Relief at not letting myself down, at not losing my containment. Right then, that was all that mattered. I tried to explain that I was one of the archaeologists working on the excavation, that my husband was away in London and that I had gone for a walk after dark with a, with a young man I had only just met. I was trying to explain this as much to myself as to anyone else. And all the time I could hear the hopeless babble of my voice, the words almost tripping over one another. I won't disturb you any further, then. In fact, we were just going, Rory. Isn't that right? Yeah, yeah absolutely. In silence, we walked back towards the house. Rory kept the torch beam trained on the path in front of my feet. When we reached the car, he opened the door, waited until the engine had caught, and waved me off as I drew away. Hello, darling. Stuart, what are you doing here? I managed to catch the milk train. Sorry to wake you, but I'm afraid there have been rather ominous developments. Oh? The papers have got wind of everything. Buried boat is British Tutankhamun. Remarkable find in East Anglia. Phillips isn't in his room. I assume he's gone over to Sutton Hoo House. I think the best thing for us to do is to go there straight away. There was no reply. Not at first. It turned out that Mrs Pretty, the owner of the excavation site, had just ordered that the telephone should be disconnected. According to her butler, she had been receiving constant calls since seven o'clock that morning. Stuart and I were standing there, wondering what to do, when Charles Phillips appeared at the door. Instead of being furious, as I'd expected, he was in a state of high excitement. Ah, Stuart, there you are. I assume you've heard what's happened. It's all Reed Moyer's fault, of course. I should have known he wouldn't be able to keep his trap shut. I doubt he wants to make everything as awkward for us as possible. Under the circumstances, I thought you two might like to take this opportunity to, uh, slip away. Slip away? Yes, after all, you are supposed to be on your honeymoon. <laughs> I don't think we're going to be able to do much more here, with all this talk of war. At least we've finished excavating the burial chamber. Well, there'll have to be an inquest in due course to determine just who the treasure belongs to, but I can't see that happening for a few weeks at least. Well, um, what do you think, darling? Darling... I don't know. Oh, I assumed you'd be pleased. Grateful, even. We are pleased, n naturally. It's just come as a bit of a shock, that's all. Soon all this will be nothing more than a happy memory. I'll be off with a pair of you before I change my mind. We drove back to the bull in silence. Stuart stayed downstairs while I went up to the room to pack. It didn't take long. After I'd handed in the key,
Stuart strapped our cases to the back of the car. By midday, we were already halfway to Norwich. It was two months before I returned to Sutton Hoo. By then, war had been declared. We drove up behind endless convoys of army trucks to attend the treasure trove inquest at Sutton Village Hall. To my astonishment, a number of press photographers were outside. The sun warmed the hut, releasing a strong smell of creosote. The coroner, Mr Viami, began by giving a brief account of the excavation and the finds that it had yielded. The point at issue, he explained, was as follows. Had the owner of the treasure been intending to come back to retrieve it at some point? If so, then the treasure would rightfully belong to the Crown. Or had the intention been that it should accompany the owner on his journey to the next world, in which case Mrs Pretty would be the legal owner? Charles Phillips was the first to be called. Mr Fiami asked him why no body had been found in the grave. Uh, that is not an easy question to answer. There are a number of possible explanations, of which two stand out. First was this might be a memorial, a cenotaph, to mark the death of someone who had died elsewhere. Alternatively, the body might simply have been destroyed by acidity in the soil. I see. And do you have any idea whose grave or memorial this might be? Yes, I believe I do. The most likely candidate is Radwald, who was King of East Anglia from about A.D. 599 to his death in about 625. According to the Venerable Bede's history of the English church and people, Radwald held sway over all the provinces south of the River Humber. Stuart was the next to be called. He confirmed that it was not unheard of for a body to disappear completely. No teeth left or anything? Um, uh, I, I'm afraid not. Sometimes nothing is left at all. Mm. Midway through the afternoon, Mr Viami concluded his questions and the jury was asked to consider their verdict. As the jury was deliberating, Mrs Pretty asked Stuart and myself, as well as the other witnesses, if we would come back to tea at Sutton Hoo House. Twenty-five minutes later, the jurors emerged. A piece of paper was passed to Mr Viami. Ladies and gentlemen... The jury has unanimously decided that the objects found at Sutton Hoo are not treasure trove. As a result, I declare Mrs. Edith May Pretty of Sutton Hoo House to be the rightful owner of everything that has been discovered there. As we tried to leave, there was an unseemly scrum. The press of people on all sides almost lifted Mrs. Pretty off her feet. With Mr. Reed Moyer on one side and Mr. Brown on the other, she was escorted to her car. Stuart and I arrived back at the house soon after the others. Tea was served in the drawing room. After a while, Phillips asked for our attention. Uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Mrs Pretty would like to say a few words. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, now that you are all here, I wanted to let you know that I have decided to give the treasure to the British Museum. Oh. I know how much this will disappoint you, Mr. Reed Moyer, and all your colleagues at Ipswich Museum. But I believe that a find of this magnitude should be seen in a national collection. Absolutely. After Mrs. Pretty's announcement, everyone congratulated her on such a generous gesture, although without a great deal of conviction in Mr. Reed Moyer's case. Then an uneasy sort of conviviality took over. I'm afraid all this talk of decay, of obliteration, it left me quite unfit for company. As quietly as possible, I slipped out of the drawing room. I don't really know what I was intending. Just to be alone, that was all that mattered. But as I passed the dining room, I saw that Mrs Pretty had laid out some of Rory's photographs on the table. And to my surprise, I saw that there were two photographs of me there. In one, I appeared to have just straightened up. There were sandy patches on the knees of my overalls, and my hair was in a mess. In the other, I was staring at a piece of jewellery that I had uncovered. The object itself could not be seen, but there was an awestruck expression on my face. 
as if I was just about to break into a smile. There you are, my dear. <laughs> I'm sorry. No, 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 no. Stay where you are. Sadly, my nephew could not be here today. He had oh. hoped to be, but in the end it was impossible. Impossible? Yes. It is simply too far from Aldershot. And I rather doubt if he would have been given permission. Well, I, I don't understand. Rory has joined up. The Royal Engineers. I assumed you knew. He enlisted as soon as he left here. No, um... No, I, I didn't know that. <laughs> this heat is very draining, isn't it? Would you care for a glass of water? No, um, thank you. Why don't we just sit here quietly for a while? I have a handkerchief, if that's what you're looking for. Uh, thank you. I've forgotten exactly where you and your husband live. In a little village called Rockbourne, uh, near Salisbury. Oh, goodness, you have had a long journey. No wonder you're tired. Tell me, my dear, do you have any plans now that this is all over? Stuart has been asked to do something by the university. Uh, near Uffington in Berkshire. The, there is a large Bronze Age fort there. Hmm. And you will help him, of course. He plainly depends on you a great deal. Uh, I don't know about that. Do you not doubt it, my dear. Not for a moment. You have such a fascinating life, you know. Do I? Well, work like yours must offer such a sense of satisfaction. Yes. Yes, it, it does. And I am quite sure it will continue being a source of great joy to you. Joy as well as sustainment. Mrs Pretty reached out and put her hand on mine. It cannot have been long afterwards that Charles Phillips's head appeared around the door. His eyes went back and forth from one of us to the other. Ah! We wonder what had happened to you both. Soon afterwards, we all wished Mrs. Pretty goodbye. I asked her to remember me to her son, Robert, who had started his new school in Ipswich. As we pulled out of the drive, we passed Basil Brown on his bicycle. He was sitting ramrod straight in the saddle, with his tweed cap on his head and his pipe stuck between his teeth. I wound down the window and waved. But I, I don't know if he saw me. Beyond Woodbridge, they were burning stubble. You could see the columns of smoke for miles around. Partridges rose into the air, screeching away as their nests were consumed. Rabbits and hares, terrified by the flames, ran across the road. But they were only escaping from one inferno into another. The whole landscape was ablaze. There was no longer any sign of the sun. Ahead of us, the road rose and disappeared into a bank of grey smoke. As we drove towards...